Good, good. Well, if you would stand with us, I would like you to think about where would you be without God's love? I want you to think about it. I know that for me, I'm like, honestly, I think I would have probably lost my natural mind. Um, but I, I want us to read Psalm 136 together. So we're going to jubilantly read. Everybody say jubilantly. All right. So you're going to say his love endures forever. I'm going to say the first part. I'll do this to let you know when, when it's your part. All right. Can everyone repeat after me and say his love endures forever. Let's, let's try that again. His love endures forever. That's it. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights. The sun to govern the day. The moon and stars to govern the night. And now let's make it personal. And Psalm, and then let's go to 23. He remembered us in our lowest state and freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. We are grateful to be here today. Amen. Are y'all grateful? I'm grateful. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose for us, right? So now I know that's some real love, right? That's, that's some real love. That's, that's love. So we're going to bask in his love once today. We're going to sing about his love, how his love sustains us, frees us, heals us, keeps us. Y'all ready? All right, let's get into it. Amen for Jesus. Amen. We rise and declare that no one nowhere compares to your love. You are holy. We stand and we shout. We can't live without your love. For you are holy, God. Oh, 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 oh forever you are holy. Say, You hold, you hold it all together. Our world, our world is in your hands. Your love, your love lasts forever. We breathe it, we breathe you in. Now we can live. We rise and declare that no one nowhere. To your love, you are holy. Stand and then we shout. Can't live without your love for you I you are holy say oh 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 forever you are holy say oh 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 forever you are holy you hold on hold it all together our world our world is in your hands your love Forever. We breathe you, we breathe you, now we can. You hold it, you all. hold it all together. 
Your love lasts forever. We breathe you. Now we can live. We rise and declare that no one nowhere compares to your love. You are holy. Stand and we shout. Can't live without your love. shepherd. But my question today, family, is who have you been following? I know sometimes as sheep, we're prone to wander, we're prone to, you know, focus on the things that concern our world. But there's two things I want us to think about. One, there's some sheep who have drifted, right? And then two, there are people who need to become sheep, right? They need to know who the Lord is, right? Need to believe in him. But in either situation, I want you to think about who you've been following and have, has it been the latest news based in our world around the fear promoted? Has it been our latest social media timeline, right, that we know is formed some marketing algorithms to keep us constantly seeing what we like and what we prefer? Is it following the GPS to destinations we know we shouldn't be? Is it following our likes and comments, right, to build our self-esteem? I got all these likes, I got all this, right, and confidence? No. Is it shopping impulsively, right, to like fill the needs that we think we need to sustain ourselves? Whatever it is that kind of catches you at times when you're low or when you're high in the mountaintop, I want you to think about who we need to surrender to, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need to always remember that we can't not want for anything without the shepherd. We must be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. Can everyone say that? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. So let's recalibrate as we sing our songs today that have Psalm 23 all up in them. All up in them. So I want you to feel comforted. I want you to know you are loved. And I want you to know that he is with you. Will you be my light when I cannot see? And when I can't take another step, Lord, will you carry me? When I've lost my fight, will you be my strength? Will you set me a table in the presence of my enemies? Yeah. I shall not want, I shall not want, uh, oh my soul's got a shepherd in the valley and I shall not want, 
I shall not want. Oh no, I shall not want. Yeah. Cause my cup's running over, running over, and I shall not want. And I will lift my eyes to where my hell comes from. And I won't be afraid of the shadow cause I've seen the sun. Yeah. No, I will not stop when the way gets hard. Cause the green only grows in the valley and that's where you are. Everybody say, I shall not want. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I shall not want. Cause my soul's got a shepherd in the Shepherd in, in the valley, valley, and I shall not want. Say, I shall not want. I shall not want. No, no, no. I shall not want. Because my cup's running over, running over. Because my cup's running over, running over, 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 and I shall not want. Say it again. Say, I shall not. I shall not want. Do you believe? I shall not. I shall not. As my soul's gonna shuffle oh, in the valley. Oh, my soul's gonna shuffle in the valley, and I shall not yeah. want. Say, I shall not I want. Shall not I want. Want. I won't lack for anything. I shall not want. Cause my cup's running over, running over. Cause my cup's running over, running over, and I shall not Everybody want. Everybody clap. I shall not want. I shall not want. I shall not want. Everybody clap your hands like this. I got everything that I need, your goodness and your mercy. I got everything that I need, your goodness and your mercy. Everybody say, I got it. I got everything that I need, your goodness and your mercy. Ooh, got everything. Got everything that I need, your goodness and your mercy. The good shepherd leads me to the water. Hallelujah, glory, hallelujah. Said I got goodness, I got goodness, and I got mercy. And I got mercy. Said hallelujah, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah. The good shepherd. To the still water, to the water. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say right there. Say I got goodness. I got goodness. And God, I got mercy. I got mercy. Hallelujah. 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 Cause the good shepherd. Oh! 
have to save us. If there was someone who was thinking, I want to end it today. Times are too hard. I pray that you would break that in the name of Jesus. That you would, Lord, bring them close to you. Draw them close to your heart, God. Remind them they are not alone. They are not by themselves. It is not the end. You have so much for them, God. I pray in the name of Jesus. Anyone who does not know you, they would come to know you, God. Will you break every chain of depression, God? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We bless your name in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, if you're grateful. Come on, if you're grateful for a good shepherd. Come on. Can you lift him up for a second? If you're grateful for a good shepherd. One who will protect you. One who will keep you. One who will fill you. One who will deliver on his promises. Give God to pray for a good shepherd. Yes. He's kept you all week long. He's sustained you. And for this we give you glory. For this we give you honor. For this we give you praise. Yeah. Come on. The fact that you know him, you ought to rejoice. Not everybody has eyes to hear. I mean, has, has ears to hear and eyes to see. But you should be grateful that you know him and he knows you. Now give God some praise. The one who delivered you. The one who's sustaining you. The one who went to a cross. Yep. Ha. One duck Friday. Ha. And he went up. Whoop, and they put nails in his hands. Whoop. Yeah, they put nails in his feet. A crown of thorns on his head. And he died huh, till death died. Give that one some praise. But I'm so glad that Friday is not where it is. But early, the power that you feel in right now, early Sunday morning, raise Jesus from the grave. Give God some. Yep. That's the one we celebrate. He is the good shepherd. So we say hallelujah, I am not alone, he is my comfort, he always holds me close, so we say hallelujah, I am not alone. Feel weak right now, but watch this. He is my comfort. He always Just the voices, no music. I want you to sing it like you really mean it, like he really is your comfort. Hallelujah. You are not. That's where you'll find rest, right there. Draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord. To thy, to thy bleeding, bleeding side. To thy, to thy precious. That's it. Bleeding side. To hear you say that I'm you are my desire, no one else will do, 
No one else can take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find my way and lead me back to you. Take your seats. I gotta sit down. You're all, you're all. That's your cry of desperation, Lord. We want nobody but you. You're all I am. Y'all sound good. Y'all actually sound like that's the only one you need. You're all I am. Can we do it one time real big? Oh. that he'll never leave you nor forsake you even where you are right now I know it's hard to praise him for where you are but you can know he's near you have a God that's near he sits high but he looks low yeah he didn't see fit to, to stay up there but he came down here and he talked among you he can still be with you now he's comforting you he's lifting you he's healing you he's Yeah. Father, we thank you. Thank you for being a God who is near. Everybody else has to do rituals to feel a vibe or to feel a presence of whatever it is. But it does not matter where we are <laughs> because you are there. If we're at our mountain peak, you're there. But if we're at our valley low, you are there. If we're in our cars, you're there. If we're at our jobs and they're getting on our nerves, you're there. When the kids won't stop misbehaving, you're there. When the husband and wife can't seem to get it right, you're there. When sickness has struck our bodies, sitting in hospital rooms, sitting in bedrooms, you're there. Thank you for being a God who is there. We'll be careful to give our God who is always with us the highest praise we have. I pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And every glad heart said, Amen. Amen. I said this in the first service and I'll say it again. For 
us as shepherds and pastors, there are five things we like to live by as we shepherd God's people. And we see those things right within the text. Throughout scripture, we see the shepherd lead, feed, know, care, and protect. And it's beautiful to know that, yes, we strive to do those things, but we have an example who leads us, who feeds us, who knows us, who cares for us, and who protects us. And that is Jesus Christ. He is the example of leading and providing and protecting us. How do I know you've been provided for? You drove in the car. You went to that gas station where the prices are sky high. Some of y'all filled the tank to full. That's evidence that God has provided for you. Some of you wear, you put on your Sunday's best because God has provided for you. You woke up this morning, you stretched your achy bones, but you were able to walk in here. You drove by that car accident. God protecting you. So there's a response of God's people. Because we have such a great and a good and an excellent shepherd, we should take what we have not be stingy because we understand that he has given us everything but we give a portion that he is not just interested in the portion he is also interested in the heart that gives so as we read today and as we give may we give with hearts of gratitude with gladness and joy when we read these words of our Lord would we read them with with a boldness that we believe exactly what he says. Let's do this call and response together. Who is uh, the owner of all things? Provides for us. The Lord of all who are brings us all who are oppressed, all high to you, and you give them the food in their time, and you will your hand and stretch out your desire every day. That's good right there. How are we to respond? How are we to get it? Indeed, he loves a cheerful giver. There are a few ways in which you can give. A basket is being passed around in the sanctuary right now. You can give that way. Um, but there's also for those who uh, like to just stay on your phone for everything. Here's a few ways in which you can do that. You can go to the Church Center app, click the uh, Give tab um, button on the screen, and you can give that way. Also, um, you can give at or visit epiphanyfellowship.org forward slash give and follow the instructions there. Um, so, yeah, that's the ways you can give. Amen. We, we give in. Amen. 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 Praise God. That's for both in-house and online. Uh, this is a, another opportunity where we get to see those uh, who have joined us for the very first time. If you're here for the very first time at Epiphany Fellowship in the sanctuary, would you please stand? Very first time. Don't be, a, don't be shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Thank y'all for coming. Thank y'all for coming. Saints, remember who those faces are. Greet them after service. Um, as they uh, are here, um, we want to stay connected with you. And so this is a way we can stay connected. You can text Epif Connect to 94000. You'll find all the information there, um, all the information you need to give. You can do everything right there, and you follow the instructions uh, for that. We are so, so, so excited that you guys decided to join us this morning uh, for this 
service. One more time for our first time visitors. Can we celebrate God for that? I have one, uh, uh, one extra announcement, and that's this Wednesday. Everybody say, this Wednesday. We have our fourth Wednesday Bible study. This, is, um, this will be held here in the sanctuary um, at 730. Um, we are continuing through our series on the Trinity. Specifically, we're focusing on the Holy Spirit. So that's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun uh, to dive in and see literally that he, it's not just this ghost. It's a person, and we should learn and know how it functions within uh, our Christian walk. Amen? Amen. So here, here, here's another thing that people might not know. I said this in the beginning of the gathering before we went stream, but I'm going to say it here again. I'm going to take it that y'all don't know that we are, like, in person for Wednesday night Bible study. Y'all didn't know. I know. I already know. Y'all didn't know. So now you know. We all got the announcement, right? Because usually we got this little section right here. But we want to see at least the bottom half. Amen? So please, please flood this place uh, for our fourth Wednesday Bible study. Um, And then, this um, this ain't on the card, but can we do this? Can y'all start getting here on time? Can y'all, please? Because y'all be thin until, like, after all the songs are done and Pastor E getting up and you just now sitting down. Come on. Come on in, please. Let's pack this place out. Come on back to church. Y'all watching. Come on back to church. Amen. Amen. And how about this? If you know somebody who ain't come to church, you need to text them and tell them, get in church. Drag them to church next Sunday. All right? Everybody in agreement? Amen. Let's pray over our offering, and we'll continue on with our gathering. Father, we thank you, and we bless you uh, for the opportunity to laugh, uh, the opportunity uh, to love on one another, the opportunity to even lift our voices to a king who is not dead but is yet alive. Lord, we thank you, and we bless you for providing all things for us. Now, Lord, would you help us to steward what what we have given today uh, for your kingdom, to advance your kingdom, Lord Jesus. We love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And every glad heart said, amen. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? Oh, come on, y'all. How you everybody doing? Amen, amen. Um. Well, today we have a lot to celebrate. We're thankful for being here, thankful for gathering. Um, Today I wanted to celebrate um, a brother who has served us pretty much the life of this church. Um, He has been an extreme blessing to this church. And um, he has, uh, when something was wrong, he's here. Uh, When a light needs changing, he was here. Something needs fixing. Whether, and this is for years, he's, he's, He's our guy. You know how the old church had a guy with like 55 keys on it, and he had the little bungee thing that came out like this. He didn't have to take it off. He, you know, he, you know. So, so, so anyway, um, but but that's been Brother Brazil for us. We said it before. No, you ain't going nowhere. Don't be. No, 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 no. Um, we, we said it before. We want to say it again how much we appreciate your faithfulness to the church. Quiet faithfulness running our facilities ministry, the volunteers, for well over a decade. And um, they don't make them like that no more. Um, and so we thank God. Uh, amen. Amen. For, for our Antiguan brother. <laughs> My favorite thing for him to come up to me and say, Brother Pasta, I love you. I support the ministry and I love you. You know, and I, me and my wife, we support, we give, we love. And that's what I love about this brother. That's who he's always been at this ministry. And so, 
as a token of our appreciation, this in this envelope represents a token of our appreciation for a representation of every single year that you've been in this ministry. And um, also, you know, you know, how you doing, Sister Steffi Steph? That's another one. That's another one. Our uh, Sister Stephanie was over our hospitality. If we would not have the hospitality ministry we have today if it was not for our first formal hospitality director coming on and doing all that she's done. So let's give a hand praise for the Hill House House. We're going to pray for you. Amen. We're going to pray for you. Father, we thank you for the Hill Houses. Thank you for what they've meant to us. And uh, they've gone through so much in his physical body, Lord God. And I just pray that you would touch him from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Lord God, we just pray over him. And would you stretch your hands towards him, y'all, that he would, everything that he's gone through just recently, that you would touch him in Jesus' name. Sister Stephanie, please come here. Um, we want to pray for you all, your bodies, um, all of the ailments and illnesses um, that you all have dealt with, uh, her back issues and some other issues that will go unnamed. We just pray for her. Everybody that's dealing with a particular sickness, we come to you, and we just pray even now for you right now and just touch you in Jesus name I touch you young lady in Jesus name that God will relieve every headache every tongue tie and everything that you're dealing with in Jesus mighty name and that he would untie it and he would ruin it so that you may be restored back to fullness of health Lord God and so God we pray in the name of Jesus that they would enjoy this season of their life Lord God and that they would enjoy you and never forget about you, Lord God. Help them to never let the enemy's thoughts and patterns and lies make them believe that you don't love them and that you don't care about them and that you're not ferociously committed to them and hopelessly in love with them. God, we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We pray that you will release a blessing on them today, Lord God, that they can't even have room, Lord God, to receive, Lord God. Release a blessing on them. Release a blessing on them, God. In Jesus' name, and I pray that you would you would send backwards what Sister Stephanie's dealing with. Send it in reverse, God. In Jesus' name, send it in reverse, God. And God, we're praying that you would continue to strengthen them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen, 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 and amen, amen. Amen. Love y'all, love y'all, love y'all. Amen. Amen. Next, we have a baby dedication. So will we have the family of Asai Miller to come forward so that we can dedicate him? A lot of people got these pandemic babies. We know why they had babies during the pandemic. Yeah, so we have a lot of babies that are here, that are, that are, that are coming, and we just thank God for them. Everybody, everybody that's in the family, come on up. Come on up. The whole clan. Family and extended family. Uh, Y'all can come on this side as well so we can spread it out. Come on in. Come on in. Big boy. How you doing? You gonna give me a hug? So, um, one, of the, one of the great things about being a church is that we're not, an, we're not merely an organization, we're an organism. Organisms are made up of living, breathing things that interact with each other and are un inseparable to one another. And when we're in Christ, one of the things that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7 is that children are, even though they may not be saved yet, they're under the covenantal connection of the parent by being experiencing some of the community connection with that and some of that community connection is not just the parents guidance and the strength but also the extended family the bible says raise up a child in the way that they should go and when they get old they will not depart from it and so everybody surrounding a child is a seed planter somebody say seed planter and you do it through both life and lips and but we know that jesus says suffer the children to come to me because the kingdom uh, exists because of such of these. And so in light of that, children are not, we're not just to be an example for children. The Bible teaches that their disposition of, in a sense, a life, natural innocence, and their disposition towards information and it's supposed to be an example of how we relate to the kingdom. And so uh, today, uh, stretch your hands forward as 
uh, we really commission mom and dad, but dedicate uh, a sigh to the Lord. Father God, we thank you today. Thank you for him. Thank you uh, uh, for Davon and Sydney and the entire family, Lord God, and that uh, and how they've been here. It's crazy to see them here now. Remember when she was in middle school and now, Lord have mercy, and now she's somebody mama and wife. And um, that's what church is about. Church is about seeing people grow in the Lord and, and seeing uh, Davon sneak in here and and walking around and acting wild and backpack on and now he walking with the Lord and is in, in, is in Bible college and uh, seeking ministerial training. And so God, this is what you do. You raise people up. And so God, uh, we pray for Asai. We pray for all of his family, not both sides of the family, one family that they are together, that they would be on one accord in raising him and loving him and helping him to know not a day when he didn't know and see Jesus clearly, Lord God. And I pray that he would come to Christ at an early age and Lord, keep him from hurt, harm, or danger and out of the wilds of the enemy. God, we dedicate this child to you and we dedicate this family to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody agree with that said? Let's give God a hand praise as we get ready for worship. Let's get ready for worship. Amen. One last worship. There you go. Amen, family. Amen. Can we make another, just give God a praise again for that just beautiful, <laughs> so good to see, it's okay, so good to see the babies dedicated. All right, please stand with us as we continue to surrender all. I just want to quickly share, in Exodus 3.13, Moses asked God a question, and he said, if I go to Israel, the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And then Jesus says in the New Testament, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the vine. So therefore, God is sufficient all in himself. So family, when we're saying what, what, what that really means is that when I say I'm hungry, right, there's nothing I can do. Like, I have to do something to fill that up, right? If I say I'm a good person, it's conditions to it. It's a limit to it. But when God says he is, he is. He's sufficient in himself. He sustains himself. So anything that you need, anything that you, anything you need to fill, God can make you feel that. Anything where you need to be, God will show you where you need to be. So let's sing about his provision for us. Amen. Amen. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out. You would cross an ocean, so I Feel right now. Oh, 
on the mountain top. Yeah. I can see so clear what it's all about. So stay by my side till the sun goes. I'm already chosen. I know who I am. I know what you spoke. I'm already loved more than I could imagine. And that is enough. I'm already loved. I'm already chosen.
situation. Amen. Amen. But let's get ready for the word. I know we've been a little bit longer than usual. Um, why don't you open up your Bibles with me? Turn to Matthew 10, 16. Matthew 10, verse 16. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Look, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Today, I'd like to tag our text like this, discernment. Movies, art, shows, movies, music, and podcasts. Father God, we thank you. Give us, don't get, Lord, you are, we already got it. Help us to use <laughs> the discernment that you give us by the Spirit. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll be back right after this video.
Our God is a creator. Um, he is the greatest creator that ever exists, but he's a God that was the first artist. It's interesting to me that God, with his mouth, could tell something to exist, and not only does it come into exist, it comes into existence in perfection. Not only does it come into existence in perfection, it's artistically crafted. In other words, our God painted with his mouth. Our God, listen, creativity didn't start with MTV or, or Paramount Pictures or Disney or Lucasfilm. Creativity and art and beauty started with our God. Matter of fact, creativity, beauty, and art isn't just what he does, but it's who he is. I don't know if you know it or not, but the Bible says that God is beautiful. That's one of his attributes, beauty. One of his perfections that describe who he is. When it, when it talks about his omnipresence, one day he's going to unveil his omnipresence. And we'll see the, the, the density of his presence in a locale that we're standing in, not realizing that where you are is where he is everywhere. I mean, God is, God is a God of, of art and order and beauty. I mean, his grace, I can't wait till I actually look at it. But we already have. Because the Bible says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And then it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Skeneod. And we beheld his glory. Glory as the only begotten of the Father. There it is. Full of grace and truth. Titus 2 says the grace of God appeared. So we've seen his grace before. But that's veiled grace tucked in a Shekinah. Uh, his Shekinah got tucked in a skin suit temporarily. But one day we're going to be seeing the flowing glory of God going through and being in through and all. He's beautiful. Now think about God. He's beautiful. And so when he created us, he created us to spread beauty. When he told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, he was telling us to spread beauty. When he said subdue the earth, he wasn't saying destroy it. What was he saying? Urbanize it. Fill it with creative art. You can cut trees down. I'll grow them back. But, but, but carve stuff. Make it beautiful. Don't worship what you carve. Enjoy it. But what happened when the fall happened is the fall let creativity and art and beauty still exist, yet be done by corrupt people. And so now we still have art, and now we still have beauty, and now we still have creativity. However, it's defaced and broken and, 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 and now it has to be restored. And in light of living in that reality, I see it all my life. I mean, sometimes you don't even know you're seeing it because creativity can be so creative and so beautiful that you don't see the corruption that the enemy can sometimes use it for as a mechanism to edutain you. Let me see if I can make it plain. I don't know if y'all remember. Please give me some time. Y'all going to give me some time, ain't you? Uh, uh, um, um, I remember back in the day, I know some of y'all don't, I used to watch Woody Woodpecker and the Flintstones and the Jetsons. You know, y'all don't even remember the, Michael, the Jackson 5 cartoon. You understand what I'm saying? Bugs Bunny. Uh, you, you, you understand? I used to, see, back then, you know, I would come home from school. Now, I don't know why they let school out at 3 o'clock and start the cartoons at 3. Knowing at that time, VCRs didn't exist. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Just Google it after church. And... I would get home and I would get me a big bowl, not one of them little blow, get me a big bowl and pour some Waffle Lowe's cereal in it. Help me today. Some of y'all, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and, 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 and I pour some milk in it, whole milk. That's before skim became cool and 2%. I drink me some whole milk. That's when you could drink the milk and it had the, the oh God, help me. And I was sitting watching my cartoons. Matter of fact, I love Saturday mornings because I would get up and watch vegetable soup first. Oh, man. During the week, I'd watch the Great Space Coast, and some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Then I'd see Roth Superstar, Hot Superstar, Hannah Barbera, and all of that stuff. Electro Woman and Donna Girl, Slee Stacks, and Land of the Lost. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. But when... 
And so, so I watch. I get up Saturday morning. And it, you, you'd be in your little, your little, your little sweatpants, shorts, and your little, uh, your little tank top, and you sitting there watching. It was only three channels. And if your same favorite cartoon came on two different channels, you couldn't record. You had to flip between the both to see if you could catch them. But as I've gotten older, as I've gotten older, I, I, I didn't realize. So, so I, I was watching. I told my kids, I'm going to introduce y'all to my cartoons. Y'all don't know about cartoons. We used to have 150 episodes. Y'all stuff go 12, and then you don't know when they bring another cartoon out. <laughs> you know, so, so uh, I, I'm watching. I said, I, I put up there, and we're watching it. And, I, you know, you watch Bugs Bunny and Woody Woodpecker and Flintstone as an adult. And you say, I can't believe what he just did. Now, I didn't realize that Flintstones was based on the Honeymooners. And some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Old school people know what I'm talking about. And, and I began to realize that their art was so great that they could make it funny for the kids and also engaging to adults. And what we have to recognize is that we live in a world that is interesting because now we live in a modern world where they don't hide nothing. I mean, now, now it's fully overt. Matter of fact, before the show comes out, they announce to you what type of framework and ideologies that they're after. They're letting us know that we're specifically after shaping your kids. And as a matter of fact, we'll rebuke you for training your kids in a biblical worldview when you decide that that's not the worldview that you want training your kids. It's called edutainment. Walt Disney developed the ideology of edutainment where he understood that if he can make it creative enough, he could turn people's senses off in order to tell them what he wants to tell them. And so we, we, we're here today because of the reality of us thinking through what it means to discern. I remember when I first became a Christian. I, I, back then when you became a Christian, it, 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 was, it was different because you got rid of everything. You got rid of all your CDs and your tapes. I used to look at my, I come against every tape in my, in my, I come against you. I see the spirit of the enemy coming off of you, coming over the air. You, you listen, y'all don't know, we were serious when we started walking with Jesus. And we got rid of everything. I mean, I missed the Biggie Tupac era. I missed the first section of the Martin seasons because I was like, I ain't watching no secular show, no TV. If it ain't talking about Jesus, if it ain't. See, some of y'all ain't never had that season yet. But, but, but one of the things that I did learn, though, one of the things that I learned is that I, I understood that I need, because I have addictive personality, so I needed that starvation without demonization. Now, what do I mean by that? I wish I was trained more in my earlier stages of my faith in discernment. Because many times we think that we can monastically break away from something thinking that sinfulness is not there because what drew me into sin isn't there anymore and sinfulness isn't present. However, the monks learned that even though they retreated from society, they still were there. The guy says, I lust over women too much. Let me cut my gorge my eyes out. He thought it was women, but he realized that he still had uh, a desire of sexual desires even though he had gorged his eyes out. In other words, you can't run from the need to discern. And so let me give you some disclaimers as we start. Number one, disclaimer. I am not just teaching you what to think, but how to think. I want you, when we talk about discernment, please stay with me. We got a lot of verses, but I got to build this. It's, it's, it's you, you, you have to learn how to think, how to navigate it. One of the things when a parent raises a child, you don't expect your child to call you every five minutes on a decision. You expect the rearing to have enough impact and influence in order for them to engage in their life and only call you as a consultant as needed. Listen, number two, I'm not policing your liberties. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to run up to you and see what you... I'm, uh, listen, I'm going to teach you and leave it to you and Jesus. I want you to be led by the Spirit and the Word. We want to talk about what it means to be led by the Spirit. To be led by the Spirit isn't led by what you're feeling. I feel like the Spirit. No, there has to be truth that roots that feeling. Looking for you to develop a robust sense of discernment. Next, develop more spiritual sensitivity. Stuff needs to bother you a little bit more sometimes. 
If you're bothered by nothing, you have no theological scruples. Next, enjoy God's world with your spiritual thinking caps on. I remember was in your first grade and the teacher said, put your thinking caps on. Well, God wants us to put on the mind of Christ in every day of our life. As I, as I continue this intro, please bear with your pastor. The, back in the day, there was a, for, for, the, for the first two, three hundred, for the post the age of reason, there's been modernity, which is a philosophy of science and everything logic. That's where you get observation, interpretation, and all of the scientific things from. But now we're post-post-modernity. Only Christians use that terminology. But it means where truth becomes relative. And what, what, what I believe that is, is, is we're in a pluralistic society. What does pluralism mean? Pluralism is the blending. Pluralism is the blending of a multiplicity of ideologies, viewing them as equal and even mergeable. So we live in a society where people say, that's truth for you, not truth for me, right? But we know that there's only one truth, and his name is Jesus, right? So you can't, you can't create with well, a Jesus that I believe in. See, everybody wants their, the Jesus they like. Some want the revolutionary. Some wants the flower child that smacks lilies and tickles Peter and eats granola. Never met him. Some people want the Jesus uh, that, that goes into the temple. Some people want Jesus that sits with the children. But I would raise you that Jesus is a whole bunch. He's, he's, listen, listen, you can't reduce him to your personal preference of what you want him to be. All right? So what pluralism does. But now, how do we navigate? Uh, 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 H. Richard Niebuhr, in his book Christ and Culture, gives us five theories and and overviews of how Christians has historically related to culture. How it's related to culture. Number one, Christ against culture. That's how most of us were taught. The women have to wear a dress from their neck to their toes. Christ against culture. Don't go to the movies. The devil is in the scream. It's a one-eyed devil. But there are times when it's proper to be against culture, right? There are times when being against culture is God's way. Next is Christ in, uh, of culture. Christ of culture. And I'm talking about Christ coming from culture. Why? Because the Bible says he had to be, in Hebrews it says he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. In other words, he was culturally a Jew. That means Jesus engaged culture and he was, uh, uh, he, I mean, came from culture rather. But we don't allow the culture to define who Christ is for us. That's the paradox. Are y'all trekking with me, family? Next, Christ above culture. This is when Christ, it doesn't mean that Christ doesn't engage culture, but culture, Jesus Christ is Lord over all cultures. I remember the old, here's your hip hop, he's Lord of all cultures, resurrected, perfecter. Uh, yeah, you, you remember them bars. Sin disconnector, eternal holder of the scepter of righteousness. Thunderous praise comes from his numberless fleet. The sovereign king. All things are placed under his feet. The uncreated, incarnated creator with all creation is to be celebrated on all occasions. Why is that? Because he's the glorious, victorious victor with all victory. And peep the unveiling mystery of the chief cornerstoner, the atoner. And we present to the world the most generous blood donor. I love it. Now I remember that. And so we see that our God is above culture. But then we see Christ and culture in paradox. So we see him in paradox. And so in paradox means it has to work together even though there's tension there. But only that, lastly, Christ the transformer of culture. Now he goes into culture and he wants to change it. And that points to the reality of what God wants us to do. Let's see some examples of that. Y'all still trekking with me, right? And so biblical figures who navigated culture. Joseph, he was in Egypt. Egypt. People to this day rep Egypt. Ain't even from there. They got onks on and talking about Hotep and Imhotep and Hosiris and all of that. And they, they never, no, no bloodline connected to it. But, um, however, Joseph had to navigate what it meant to be in a slave master's household. He had to navigate what it meant to keep his Jewish culture and function theologically as a Jew, but also rule a kingdom called Egypt while engaging them who believed in other gods. Esther, 
was in a, a Persia and, and with the Medes, and she had to navigate as a woman in that society and culture while remembering the heritage of her covenant with God. Right now you had Nehemiah that was, a, that was in Babylon and Persia. Now you have to understand he was the cupbearer. So that means that he was at the side of Artaxerxes at all time holding the cup and holding his cup of wine and had to drink it before he gave it to him to make sure that Artaxerxes wouldn't die. But in the king's court, in the emperor's court was orgies. So he had to figure out how to walk in moral purity while sometimes the king, the, the Persians were wild. People were getting murdered in front of him. If they brought somebody they got judged, he would bring the person, they would keep in front of him. And he had to navigate being a Jew who's under covenant with God and being a culture. Do we have people that can see the mess going on around them but still push to walk in purity even though all hell is breaking loose around you, even though everybody else around you ain't acting right? But you say, I'm going to live for Christ no matter what. Now, that don't mean because he was in the presence of the orgy that you can watch porn now. Oh, oh, he was in the presence, you know. I can be a cupbearer. No. <laughs> you know, we get ideas. That's in the Bible. Dang, where that background commentary at, Joe? All right, Ezra. Ezra, same thing. Daniel, he had to learn how to be a political figure that represented a theocracy. He was in an absolute monarchical society, but he covenantally was in connection with the eternal monarch, and he still had to remind the monarch that he wasn't his king. Because when culture clashes with your king, you have to critique the culture. You got to critique it. So, and, but, but this, if the issue is we're worried about losing our job. He had to worry about losing his life. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hananiah, Mishai, and Azariah, they told the king, we serve you. We, we, we going to eat salad for the next few. You understand what I'm saying? We're going to eat some salad. Amen. But then when, when, when and people do better. But then they got to a point where they wouldn't worship what everybody else would worship. And they were, and they were willing to die for it. Jesus was under the Roman Empire and Jewish leadership. Paul went to Roman Empire, Hellenistic culture, and various groups and subcultures. Well, Duas is important. In all of these places, we need discernment. Somebody say discernment. discernment. What is discernment? Discernment comes from, don't put, the, don't put the definition up yet. Discernment comes from the idea of Proverbs chapter 1. Discernment is one of the ways in, that we fear God. Right? Fear God means to stand in awe of who God is. That's why it says in verse 7 of Proverbs chapter 1 that the fear of God is be the beginning of wisdom. And in Proverbs, it's giving us two types of people, people who don't fear God and those who fear God. The fool is the one who doesn't fear God. The wise is the one who fears God. The fool is, in the, one, is the one who says in his heart that there is no God. The wise is the one who says that there is a God. Now, you can say you fear God, but you don't walk wisely. That means you're a fool. So the, every proverbial application points to fearing God. So when it says this, it says, for receiving prudence, this is what truth is for, uh, 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 instruction in righteousness, justice and integrity, for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to the young man or woman. Let a wise person listen and increase in learning and listen to, uh, listen, uh, 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 let a discerning person obtain guidance to understand or discern a proverb. So what is discernment? Hear me. <laughs> discernment, you can put it up there now, is the ability to know the difference between the good, the grave, and the gray. Yeah. Stop right there. <laughs> it's the ability, first off, to know the difference between the good, the grave, and the gray. The good is what you can do. <laughs> the grave is what you can't do. And the, grave, the gray is what you can choose to do or not. Now, the mature person knows how to work through this. So let me finish. The sermon is the ability to know the difference between the good, 
the grave and the gray while navigating a fallen world being led by God's spirit, God's word, godly experiences, and godly influences. And you can't do these alone. That means you have to be around others. Some of us have gone into the pandemic and have made life-altering stupid decisions because of a lack of discernment and a lack of community. <laughs> and, and, and many of you, before you make the worst decision of your life, needs to get in some community and get some godly counsel before you make that decision in isolation because you've been watching a bunch of videos. We're going to talk about that in a second. <laughs> Next one. Next one. Number two. Discernment is knowing your purpose in life. And shrewdly making choices that don't compromise that purpose while navigating life. So when you, know your, when you don't know your purpose, abuse is inevitable. But when you know your purpose, you know who you are, who you are, and what's your purpose, then it helps you to, I, I would say, navigate personally so that you can know where not to compromise. Because when you're walking in purpose, you know that which downgrades your value. Lastly, it's the ability to make mature decisions. <clears throat> now, the question though is, now y'all got a definition of discernment. Who's pastoring you? Put them up there. Put them up there. I'm gonna, let's see, this is who pastoring some of y'all. This is who pastoring some of y'all. <clears throat> this, this is who pastoring some of y'all. You understand? But see, a discerning person can know and watch, and I'm not telling you not to watch any of this, right? What I am saying is, you have to have discernment. Now, what does that look like? Y'all tracking with me? I can appreciate her entrepreneurial acumen, but rebuke her universalism. I can appreciate how she is uh, just welcoming to people, but disagree with her philosophy of gender. I, I, can, I, can, I can agree with some of his social and political commentary, but I must disagree with what he believes about God. I can agree with his, uh, his uh, educational acumen of what he teaches uh, from as a professional based on general revelation about black boys and girls in the inner city. But what I will not do is, is buy into the buffoonery of his, of his pra practicality and his cursing and his misogyny of women, even though he's the Prince of pan Africanism, talking about y'all bodies and trying to get in your bodies, acting like he just wants your mind. Yeah, he live on 18th Street. Come see your boy. So I'm saying... We as Christians must have discernment. I'm not here to police what you watch and don't watch. But what I want you to do is, do you think Christianly? Do you have a biblical worldview? Or do you just slide in and let whatever they say believe, whatever they say matter, whatever they say influence you? Do you watch? That's why you got to be careful of your leisure time. Because your leisure time is when your guard's down the most. And you, and you think you're watching a video just to lean back and lay back and relax. But you don't even realize that the enemy is nurturing you with seeds of demonic divisiveness against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who bought you with a price. First point. Enjoyment must be balanced with discernment. <laughs> Says in Matthew... 10, 16 that we read earlier. Look, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. <clears throat> Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. This is dope. <clears throat> because one of the things Jesus says, he said, I know I'm sending you out in a world where you're going to be attacked. Now, it doesn't mean when he calls us sheep that we're weak. He says it looks weak because you're going to be attacked. The point is, you are going to be attacked. Amen. The problem with many of us is we like to turn down our faith so that we can avoid attack. Amen. 
So many of us are secret agent Christians. We, 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 not, we, we haven't gone public. Everybody else coming out and letting you know who they are and Christians, we're going into the bushes like Bart Simpson in that meme. And nobody knows you're a Christian. Nobody knows you love Jesus. Nobody knows you got standards. Nobody knows you're supposed to be committed to him. Nobody knows that you're not supposed to be wild enough. They think you one of them. He said, therefore, be shrewd yeah. <laughs> as serpents. I love this. Innocent as does. This is a beautiful illustration. <clears throat> so his point ultimately points to his high priestly prayer where he says, Lord, I have not taken them out of the world, but I want you to keep them while they're in the world. In other words, you're supposed to be insulated, not isolated. In other words, you're supposed to be insulated from the effects of the world, but not isolated from living in and engaging that world. So what does it look like to be as shrewd as a serpent? See, serp serpents are crafty, wise with their attacks. They sneak up on you, but they also use their tongue because they can't see. So they don't use their natural physical sight. They have to use another sense that they have in order to see what's around them through, and they trust their tongue, and they fling it out into the wind, and whatever they taste, they process it. So we're supposed to be, we're supposed to not look with our physical eyes, but we're supposed to use our spiritual eyes to see what's out there and let our spirit sense the reality of that based on God's word. But not only that, what I like about snakes is they can skillfully navigate through tough terrain. So that's what he wants you to do. Be wise like a serpent. Navigate it because you, you are anointed for tough terrain. That's what he, he anointed you for what you, some of you going through some hard stuff, God put you there because he wanted you to spiritually slither through it and not let it destroy you. Yo, see, snakes, their body adjusts to rocks. Their body adjusts to sticks. The bodies adjust to dirt. In other words, when a snake is going over something, its muscles just slide over it like it ain't even nothing because their body was made to work its way through tough terrain. Let me tell you something, body of Christ. When God saved you, he saved you to work your way through some tough terrain. He saved you so that you can work your way through some hard situations. Be wise. But he says, not only be wise as a serpent, he says, be innocent as a dove. That means you can't be a drama king or queen. You're supposed to be a peacemaker. When people see you, they should see peace, not chaos. You're supposed to, be, you're supposed to, you're supposed to change the vibe. You're supposed to be the one. I like being around Shorty. Shorty got good vibes. They call their vibes for some old new age stuff, but they don't know it's from the king of kings. I use your word. But you also got to be careful <coughs> with your discernment in this world for another reason. You know, in, in 1995, there was a march that went on called the Million Man March. And I remember, and it was, it was historic. <clears throat> but I, I was like, should I go? And as I began seeing the lead ups to it, Farrakhan started calling it a Day of Atonement. So, let me explain something to you. There's nothing wrong with marching with people in the world for the good of change. That's Romans 13. That's 1 Timothy chapter 3. Nothing wrong with it. However, it needs to be political and sociological for the philanthropy of all people. Right? As long as what we're fighting for doesn't violate scripture. However, when you add atonement to it, now this is no longer political, it's spiritual. So now, the reason why I didn't go to the Million Man March is because I'm not, Farrakhan isn't my Mahdi or my Messiah. That he, that, and he's mediating, he viewed himself as another Messiah mediating the black male community to its community under the honorable Elijah Muhammad. And so that way I left. And I got called a coon, a house, you know what. <laughs> and guess what? 
I gladly took on the title. You know why? Because if I got to be that to not, listen, my blackness must be influenced by my God. Listen, I'm not, some of us are too led by our blackness. As soon as somebody say black, all our Bible go off. And listen, you know you're talking, I woke, wrote woke church and urban apologetics. So you're not talking to no coon up here. Right? But, but, I, but what I am saying, though, is my blackness isn't king. It's not. It's what, matter of fact, if I operate in my blackness without Jesus, I'm less than black now. Because he made me black. And my blessed blackness is next to Jesus. Your blackness is redeemed through him. Oh, I can stay on that for the rest of our time. Next point. What you take in can affect your emotions and values. <laughs> what you take in can affect your emotions and values. There, there it is in, in, in Philippians. It says, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Here, here he talks about worrying. <laughs> worrying is, is, is being overwhelmed by what you took on and believing that you can get life done in your own strength. That's when anxiety comes. But that worry affects us in every area of our life. <laughs> Why? Because worldliness is a form of worriness, right? And so that's why Jesus said in the parable of the soils in Matthew, I believe chapter 12 or 13, he talked about the fact that one of the soils, which was the one, the thorny ones, was when the worries of the world came, it choked it out. Why? Worry chokes out truth. Listen, I remember my, I remember my um, <clears throat> the therapist I had one time, <clears throat> and I was just talking to him. He was asking me questions. Good therapists know how to ask you questions and draw out of you your practical worldview, not your theological worldview. He said, so he said, I know what you believe, but tell me how you really feel. And when I began talking, he said, that's a lie, Eric. I said, what you talking about? He says, that's a lie. I ain't going to tell y'all what I said in my therapy session because ain't none of y'all business. But I will say something like, say you say, nobody cares for me. And that's something that you live by. Nobody really cares, so I got to do everything on my own. And what he began saying to me is he says, you have to speak to that worry with, because see, that's demonic. Yeah. But you got to take God's word and rephrase that biblically. Yeah. And what he began to do is he said, you have to utilize this statement as a guide every time the enemy tries to bring up that thing that has been a guide for your life. Yeah. And many of us, our worldliness is rooted in our worries. And what begins to happen is when, you, when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when your life is rooted in your worries, you don't root them in Christ, and therefore you find it outside of Christ. That's why you go into your liberties versus going to your liberator. So he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true. Woo! Whatever's true, right? He says whatever true. What's genuine? What's authentic? Not your truth. There's only one truth, right? There are a lot of facts, but there's only one truth. He says, whatever is honorable, that's pertaining to what is worthy of respect, evoking special respect, venerable, if you will. Whatever is just, in other words, he's saying, keep these things on your mind when it comes to worries. And by application, keep these on your mind in the way you think through things that you watch and engage, Right? But check this out, whatever is pure. I like this. When he talks about whatever is pure, he's talking about a, a, a purity a, a, that, that, that points to that which points you towards moral development. And in our world, many of us don't realize that we've got into stuff that's not truthful. We've got into stuff that's not honorable. We've got into stuff that's not just. And we have been influenced by things that aren't pure. Watch this video and hear what I'm talking about. I've added um, practices of spirituality into my Christian walk um, just to help me with various things. And I love um, that I'm able to find parallels between um, the two. So the first two that I have written down is baptism and Christianity and the spiritual bath and spirituality. 
Um, baptism in Christianity is an outward expression of an inward decision. To, I've added um, practices of spirituality into my Christian walk um, just to help me with various things. And I love um, that I'm able to find parallels between um, the two. So the first two that I have written down is baptism in Christianity and the spiritual bath and spirituality. Um, baptism in Christianity is an outward expression of an inward decision to follow Christ Jesus. You are baptizing yourself in this water that has been blessed. Um, basically to when you are submerged in this water, you will come out a new person. You will be smarter. You will be stronger. You know, you will be more positive. You will be more light. You know what I'm saying? You will choose the light. And I feel like spiritual baths kind of represent the same thing. Um, submerging yourself in a body of water that is blessed, that is pure, that is to bring you love, good health, wisdom, peace, clarity, and coming out renewed, coming out a new person, coming out more energetic and more energized and more positive and more ready for the world. When I take a spiritual bath, that's how I feel. You know, I take my spiritual baths and I bless my water and I just know that source is going to come through that water and bless me and purify me. And I think that everybody believes the same thing. Also, holy oil in Christianity, I feel like it's a parallel to every holy relic in um, spirituality. As far as crystals is concerned, sage, palo santo, um, singing bowls, whatever you use. Um, oil is literally extra virgin olive oil that some pastor buys from the store, prays over it, makes it holy. Um, he might fast for seven days and pray over it for the entire seven days, whatever. He blesses and calls on source to come through him so he can charge this oil to where everyone he touches with this oil is anointed. Everyone he touches with this oil is blessed. You know, that is basically what the making of oil is. I feel like it's the same thing with crystals and with whatever. Whenever you are doing releasing rituals, you can do it with a crystal, you can do it with a stick, you can do it with a rock, you can literally do it with anything. It's all about the intention in which you feel. And if you are taking a crystal and you're not asking for the rock to bring you love and peace, you're asking for source to flow through that rock and let that rock be a catalyst, a physical re representation of the love that you are getting from source. And as long as you have this rock with you, source is going to, you know, be represented in that, giving you whatever you're trying to infuse and charge in your crystals. The main purpose of us being on this earth is just to heal ourselves, learn lessons for the lifetimes beyond this one, try to heal as many people as we can, try to bless as many people as we can, try to be a light to as many people as we can. And whatever you want to use from source, from energy, from universe, whatever you want to use from spirit, your spirit, God's answers, whatever, whatever you want to use from that is for you to use you can take things from here and things from here and put them together. If it doesn't work, fine. If it works, perfect. So I've added um, practices of spirit. <clears throat> now, some of y'all in here like, I resonate with that. Some of y'all in here like, I agree with that. I'm not here to beat you up, but I am here to tell you it's wrong. You can't, the universe is not awake. It's a, it's, a, it's a good song that KB has out of, that talks about the universe, the universe ain't got no will. The universe, universe will tell you to chill. The universe, universe say, I'm talking about him. In other words, the universe points to him. So she talked about sources and things, and she just talked about how she felt and what she thought and no source. But many of us are educated off of a lot of this stuff. And when you don't have a biblical worldview and you're not being discerning, listen, I don't, listen, there's nothing wrong with crystals. Listen, but I don't use them as a channeling source. Now, you know what? I, I, God created crystals, though. And my grandmama used to have this wood cabinet in her dining room. And she had his glass, and that's where all of the china and whatnots were. You know what I'm talking about? And we used the glass, and guess what? We used that on times where we got together where the crystal thing was out, and you made the punch, with the, had the red punch with the ginger ale or the sherbet punch, and you had the hook spoon that was that. That's what crystal is good for. Anything wrong with sage? No, it's good in sausage. It's very good in some sausage. Thank God for sage. 
Is anything wrong with a stick? Nah, it's good for beating kids with. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> All things are useful. Right? But we don't utilize anything as a... Now, now, now this is what I want to... I want y'all to hear this. She said, we pray for seven days. Now, she just made that up. You know what I'm saying? But somebody be like, Pastor, see, pastors be praying for seven days over oil. And, be, and just be thinking they spitting like knowledge. But anybody will make a myth. And in the midst of that, you'll find yourself saying, I feel like I like that. It was someone that used to go here. And I, I, and I don't know why their page came up. And I went, and they were, they were chanting and waving sage and talking about what they, and I could not believe it. Like, if you knew the person, they talked theology, they said in classes, they asked questions, but somehow, but they went through some trials and some struggles, and then what began to happen is they didn't think Jesus worked, they didn't endure with Jesus, and so they thought that they would find it in his creation. I'm trying to let y'all know, family, he said, whatever's commendable. He said, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. I'm going to close with this. We know that this stuff is influential. I'll give you some praise. We, we see that how music and art is very influential. Listen, 1 Samuel 18, 7 and 8. This inferentially about this in this descriptive passage. It says, as they danced, as the woman sang, Sam, Saul, Saul has killed his thousands David has killed his ten thousands. Saul was furious and resented this song. They credited tens of thousands to David, and he complained, but they credited uh, them uh, 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 thousands to me. What more can he have for the kingdom? He knew that that song was influencing the kingdom against him. Why? Because we know that singing is influencing. Now, this is not wrong, but we're just talking about discernment. Ecclesiastes 7 5 says, It is better to listen to the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. I remember as listening to Public Enemy and loving their music, but frustrated with some of their views of my faith. I remember listening to Oprah's humanitarianism, but shunning uh, that Christ alone had faith. I, I'm, I'm a Jay-Z fan as it relates to his lyricism and, and his swag and his grown man journey. But I part with him when he calls himself Jehovah. And calling him and being a five percent, a, 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 a quasi five percenter with the number seven, a, 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 a arm, arm, a, a arm, leg, leg, arm, head, meaning Allah, man is Allah, God body, right? But then not only that, him utilizing his music and his songs and his art to talk about his grandfather who, who molested his aunt is public. And he utilized that as to say Christianity can't be worth anything because of that one experience with that one person. And what it does is it begins to identify with your hurt towards different things of people who are Christian. And then you'll reduce Christianity to your experience with that person versus recognizing that that person isn't fully representative of Christianity, but that person was doing sinful things that should be judged based on that situation and should not be used as a mechanism to say what Christ is like. That's why we have to be renewed based on Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. I'm done. In the spirit of our minds. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Living. That means your life is not your own. Even when you're doing what is free, you're free to do. It's not your own. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true worship. What's true worship? Knowing that your life isn't your own. Do not be conformed to this world. There are two types of people. There are Plato people and there are master mold people. See, master molds think they can mold God. And God is the Plato. And you, you ever had that thing, the kids... Had a little press down thing. I want to up here to, and they put the little thing through, and you press the plate up, put the plate up, press it down, and then the image comes out based on what shape you put in there. That's what people think. They, that's what people want to do with God. But when you're a Christian, when you're a Christian, God's the master mold, and you're the Plato. And he puts you in it, and he presses on you, and he puts Christ's image in front of it. And when you come out of there, as you get pressed, as you get pushed, as you come out, your clay comes up to be formed in the image of Jesus Christ. And so, that's why he died on the cross. He didn't give his life for us to act like his life meant nothing. 
Listen, we're the seed of the woman. We give Eve a, Eve a bad rap. One of the things I like about God and how he treated Eve, he told her even in her fallenness that he, he, said, he said, her seed will be at enmity with yours, which lets you know that she would repent and raise a godly seed. And that first woman who you claim you want to chew out in the kingdom, you wouldn't exist without her raising up a godly seed. And, but there's Satan's seed, and only those who are in Christ are her seed. These are some takeaways. Takeaway number one, enjoy the world, but don't be consumed by it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Next, keep your thinking caps on. Keep your thinking caps on. Next, don't separate enjoyment from Jesus. And lastly, remember that even in your enjoyment, you are a witness. My prayer for us as believers is that as we live out our walk with Jesus Christ, is that we wouldn't have false dichotomies of sacred and secular, but recognize that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And because everything's his, we get to enjoy it. And he sees all things. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as Savior. We would love to talk to you about what it means to live the freest life you could ever live. Somebody say, well, I'm free now. You just don't know it. You can be in a prison and be free. That movie Matrix, he thought he was free and he was doing, but he knew something was wrong. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5 that God has placed eternity in our hearts. Why? He, what is eternity in our hearts? He placed in us a sense that there's more here than what we see. He sent Jesus to be the one who we do see, but knowing that all of Jesus that you saw wasn't all of who he is because he's God. And he gave him the ability to live the life that we can never live, die the death that we can never die, get it from the grave with all power in his hands. Whoever trusts in him would have salvation. And you'll have the freest freedom because you'll have freedom with restraints. Restraints are actually freedoms in the form of protection. And that's what God does for us. Maybe you're here today and you want to say yes to Jesus. We'd love to talk to you about him. Hold your hand in the air. We'd love to talk to you. Anybody want to know Jesus as Savior today? On the floor, up top, our team are in the comments on YouTube. They'll put a, 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 a um, email in there where you can respond there and say, yes, I want to know more. Anyone here says they want to know Jesus as Savior? Anyone wants to place their confidence in a man in the air? Amen. Well, let's prepare our hearts and minds for communion. If you do not have the elements, hold your hand up. We want to make sure that you get the elements. We have one in the back wall on the floor. Anyone else that don't have communion and wants to take communion? Let's stand to our feet. Communion is a sign of two things. I mean, it's many things, but it's a sign and connection to this. Of course, Christ's body. It's also is the reality of the fact that we are reminded of our connection to Jesus, our responsibility, and our freedom in him but our responsibility to him. Let us eat together. Jesus was a living sacrifice. His blood poured out for us was that sacrifice. And this is a reminder that we don't give a sacrifice for our sin and we don't add up or add to Christ's death, but we do respond to it by us being poured out for him. Let us drink together. Maybe be seated for one moment as we have a quick announcement, then we'll be dismissed. Can we, can we thank God for the word again? Can we thank God for the word? Amen. Amen.
Amen. Pray that you were blessed by it. A few announcements. You can find all these announcements if you text APIF Connect to 94000. Uh, but here are the announcements for this week. Uh, Camp Hope registration is now open. Um, uh, we are excited to open up for the summer. It will be running from June 20th uh, through August 12th uh, for kids um, the ages of 5 through 12. So if you got your kid, you need to sign them up. Amen. Um, so that they can enjoy a summer where they not just have fun, but they can hear about Jesus. They can hear. Okay. Amen. Um, so please do that. Also, we, we uh, pushed um, for those who have the availability to help out um, uh, during Camp Hope. You might not want to work here, but you can definitely uh, offer up some hours. Please, please uh, reach out uh, to us. You can, again, do that through text, and you can text uh, or email uh, T. Sloan at Epiphany Fellowship. Just let them know exactly what you're looking for. Amen. Um, to help with that. Also, uh, 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 Epiph Youth Ministry is meeting this Friday at 7 p.m. Uh, so if you got some teenagers, come on, send them here. You, 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 you know you want to get rid of them for, for a few hours. So you can go ahead and do that. Uh, you can send them here at 7 p.m. this Friday. Also, uh, everybody say Fourth Wednesday Bible Study. We are in person again. Um, uh, 7.30 this Wednesday here at the building. We are continuing on with the Trinity uh, series, uh, but we are specifically focusing on the Holy Spirit. Amen. The way you're going to know how to live and have discernment is if you know how the Holy Spirit works. You got to submit to what he's saying, not what you want to do. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So please join us 7.30 this Wednesday. Last but not least, everybody, I want everybody, everybody, if you have your phone right now, I want you to take it out. Come on, y'all can do it. I want y'all to do it. I want you to mark your calendars for June 5th. Y'all still looking at me? Come on, grab your phone. I'm serious about this. June 5th is we want the entire church to join us because we are going to the park. We're going to have some food. We're going to fellowship. We're going to have some fun. And we want you all to be there so we can grow as a church. Amen. Amen, everybody. And so that's June 5th. It will be um, at Sunset Social. Say that three times fast. Amen. Um, but this is, again, an opportunity for us to come together outside of uh, the corporate gathering on a Sunday morning. Um, but we can go to the park and have some fun, you know, do the cha-cha slide. I don't know what we're doing at this. Have we ever been doing slides lately? It's the pandemic. All right. It doesn't matter. Um, but please be looking out for an email about this. Um, but again, please mark your calendars for June 5th. Everybody say June 5th. June 5th. I will be there. Are right, you committed? So would you go ahead and stand as we dismiss, receive this benediction. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all times, now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Go in peace. Praise God for that message. If you're like me, after hearing that, you want to sit down with somebody and have a conversation about it. Well, here's your chance. My name is Tamara Bullock, and I'm one of the members of the Surge Evangelism team, where our goal is to help you look more like Jesus. You can reach us at surge at epiphanyfellowship.org. You can reach out to us if you have any questions about the message, or if you just want to hear about the gospel message of Jesus for the first time. We'd love to hear from you or connect with you. Grace and peace.